purpose does the gentlewoman from North Carolina rise? Mr. Speaker, I send to the desk a privileged report from the Committee on Rules for filing under the rule. The clerk will report the title. Report to accompany House Resolution 269. Resolution providing for consideration of the bill, H.R. 1216, to amend the Public Health Service Act to convert funding for graduate medical education and qualified teaching health centers from direct appropriations to an authorization of appropriations. Providing for consideration of the bill, H.R. 1540, to authorize appropriations for fiscal year 2012 for military activities of the Department of Defense and for military construction to prescribe military personnel strengths for fiscal year 2012 and for other purposes and waiving a requirement of Clause 6A of Rule 13 with respect to consideration of certain resolutions reported from the Committee on Rules. Referred to House Calendar and ordered printed. Pursuant to Clause 8 of Rule 20, proceedings will resume on motions to suspend the rules previously postponed. Votes will be taken in the following order. H.R. 1627 by the yeas and nays, H.R. 1383 by the yeas and nays, H.R. 1657 by the yeas and nays. The first electronic vote will be conducted as a 15-minute vote. Remaining electronic votes will be conducted as five-minute votes. The unfinished business is the vote on the motion of the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Miller, to suspend the rules and pass H.R. 1627 as amended, on which the yeas and nays are ordered. The clerk will report the title of the bill. Union calendar number 45, H.R. 1627, a bill to amend Title 38, United States Code, to provide for certain requirements for the placement of monuments in Arlington National Cemetery and for other purposes. The question is, will the House suspend the rules and pass the bill as amended? Members will record their votes by electronic device. This will be a 15-minute vote. The House just came back in, 6.30 p.m. Eastern Time. They're voting on a bill. It sets the requirements for the placement of monuments in Arlington National Cemetery. While they take this vote, we'll go now to an interview about the week ahead in Congress. We're on the phone with Russell Berman of the Hill to talk about Congress as the House returns from a week-long district work period. What's the legislative agenda for this week looking like? Well, they have a busy week in the House. Um, after uh, a week-long recess, they're going to be uh, dealing with several uh, reauthorization bills, um, uh, one for the FAA, one for the Patriot Act, which has gotten a lot of attention, and then a defense authorization bill over the next few days. Uh, and they're also uh, going to be hearing from the Prime Minister of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu, tomorrow, who's going to address a joint meeting of, uh, of Congress in the morning. On the defense authorization bill, what are some of the key issues to be debated when that comes up for consideration? Well, there's going to be um, w one thing that we expect that's uh, sort of a new development is that we expect that there's going to be an amendment related to the Libya uh, mission. Um, the president late last week uh, endorsed a Senate uh, draft of a resolution that would express congressional support for the Libya uh, mission. Uh, and the House is expected to have some uh, version. It's not clear whether it's going to be the same or a, a different version, uh, but that's going to be likely attached as an amendment to the defense authorization bill. Uh, there's also um, going to be continued debate over the joint strike uh, fighter um, alternate engine, which has sort of uh, lived and, and died uh, several times over the last couple of years. The administration uh, opposes it, but it has some... A powerful interest uh, still fighting for it in the House, uh, most notably the Speaker, John Boehner. What about the extension of the Patriot Act provisions? What are we likely to hear from House lawmakers on that measure? Well, that's going to be very interesting because the 
uh, w when the House GOP tried to extend on a short-term basis uh, this uh, measure a couple of months ago. They were surprised when on the first attempt uh, under a suspension of the rules requiring a two-thirds vote, it failed. They had to bring it back up when uh, and then it passed. But basically you have a lot of uh, uh, conservatives who have a li libertarian bent and a lot of the, the freshman uh, Republicans have concerns over whether 10 years after September 11th, uh, some of these me uh, measures that critics say are an uh, uh, in infringement on uh, privacy rights and give the government too much power, uh, whether they're still needed and whether they're warranted. And so we're going to see some debate on that. The, uh, the House Republican leadership has been whipping this vote um, more aggressively than it did uh, the last time. And they're pretty confident that they will uh, be able to to pass, um, uh, you know, the version that comes out of the Senate. Well, you attended a briefing today with House Majority Leader Eric Cantor, Republican from Virginia. What did he discuss with reporters in that briefing? He discussed the uh, the agenda that we've just discussed for the week, and he also he made some news actually on the political front when he was asked, um, uh, there's been obviously a lot of talk about the Paul Ryan budget, and it's been made into quite uh, the political lightning rod. Uh, he was asked if Paul Ryan, the budget committee chairman, should run for president, and he said sure, uh, and that Paul Ryan is a, is a real leader and, and is about real leadership. And so that made some news because there has been some talk about Paul Ryan jumping into the race. Um, Eric Cantor also talked a little bit about um, Israel with the Prime Minister's uh, uh, speech coming up to Congress uh, tomorrow. And he also talked about the fact that the House Republicans are going to be unveiling what they call a growth agenda later this week, likely on Thursday, which will be um, a collection of bills aimed at reducing uh, government regulation, which has, been, uh, has long been a promise of theirs, and aimed at um, boosting uh, job creation. The Republicans have taken some flack from Democrats for being too focused on cutting spending and not enough about actually uh, growing jobs. Russell Berman of The Hill, we appreciate your time. Thanks so much.
We are in the first of a series of three votes tonight. This first bill sets the requirements for the placement of monument, monuments in Arlington National Cemetery. And after this, the second bill in tonight's series of three is the Restoring GI Bill Fairness Act of 2011. It sets the amount payable for college for veterans enrolled in the VA's post-9-11 educational assistance program. I'll also let you know that later tonight, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu will be speaking before the American-Israel Public Affairs Committee's annual conference. He'll be there along with House Speaker John Boehner and Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid and we'll bring live coverage of that to you starting at 8.45 p.m. Eastern. It'll be on our companion network, C-SPAN 2. And tomorrow, the House and Senate will be in the House chamber to hear from the Israeli Prime Minister. He'll address the chamber starting at 11 a.m. Eastern tomorrow.
80. The nays are zero, two-thirds being in the affirmative. The rules are suspended. The bill is passed, and without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid upon the table. The unfinished business is the vote on the motion of the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Miller, to suspend the rules and pass H.R. 1383 as amended, on which the yeas and nays are ordered. The clerk will report the title of the bill. H.R. 1383. A bill to temporarily preserve higher rates for tuition and fees for programs of education at non-public institutions of higher learning pursued by individuals enrolled in the post-9-11 educational assistance program of the Department of Veterans Affairs before the enactment of the post-9-11 Veterans Educational Assistance Improvements Act of 2010 and for other purposes. The question is, will the House suspend the rules and pass the bill as amended? Members will record their votes by electronic device. This will be a five-minute vote. And the House is in the second of a series of three votes tonight. The second bill in tonight's series is the Restoring GI Bill Fairness Act of 2011. It will set the amount payable for college for veterans enrolled in the VA's post-9-11 educational assistance program. And after this, the third bill tonight will be a bill to change the penalties for any business that misrepresents itself as a small business owned and operated by a veteran. You're watching live coverage of the House here on C-SPAN.
out. are 389, the nays are zero, two-thirds being in the affirmative, the rules are suspended. The bill is passed and without objection the motion to reconsider is laid upon the table. The unfinished business is the vote on the motion of the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Miller, to suspend the rules and pass... Calendar number 46, H.R. 1657, a bill to amend Title 38, United States Code, to revise the enforcement penalties for misrepresentation of a business concern as a small business concern owned and controlled by veterans or a small business concern owned and controlled by service-disabled veterans. The question is, will the House suspend the rules and pass the bill? Members will record their votes by electronic device. This is a five-minute vote. And the House is in a series of three bills. This is the last of the three. It would change penalties for any business that misrepresents itself as a small business owned and operated by a veteran. And businesses owned by veterans are entitled to special access to government contracts. You're watching live coverage of the House here on C-SPAN 3. Sorry, and apologies, that's on C-SPAN. going to take a look at the week ahead in Congress. We're on the phone with Russell Berman of the Hill to talk about Congress as the House returns from a week-long district work period. What's the legislative agenda for this week looking like? Well, they have a busy week in the House. Um, after uh, a week-long recess, they're going to be uh, dealing with several uh, reauthorization bills, um, uh, one for the FAA, one for the Patriot Act, which has gotten a lot of attention, and then a defense authorization bill over the next few days. Uh, and they're also uh, going to be hearing from the Prime Minister of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu, tomorrow, who's going to address a joint meeting of, uh, of Congress in the morning. On the defense authorization bill, what are some of the key issues to be debated when that comes up for consideration? Well, there's going to be um, w one thing that we expect that's uh, sort of a new development is that we expect that there's going to be an amendment related to the Libya uh, mission. Um, the president late last week uh, endorsed a Senate uh, draft of a resolution that would express congressional support for the Libya uh, mission, uh, and the House is expected to have some uh, version. It's not clear whether it's going to be the same or a different version, uh, but that's going to be likely attached as an amendment to the defense authorization bill. Uh, there's also um, going to be continued debate over the joint strike uh, fighter um, alternate engine, which has sort of uh, lived and, and died uh, several times over the last couple of years. The administration uh, opposes it, but it has some uh, powerful interests uh, still fighting for it in the House, uh, most notably the Speaker, John Boehner. What about the extension of the Patriot Act provisions? What are we likely to hear from House lawmakers on that measure? Well, that's going to be very interesting because the, uh, w when the House GOP tried to extend on a short-term basis uh, this uh, measure a couple of months ago, they were surprised when on the first attempt uh, under a suspension of the rules requiring a two-thirds vote, it failed. They had to bring it back up when, uh, and then it passed. But basically, you have a lot of uh, uh, conservatives who have a li libertarian bent, and a lot of the, the freshman uh, Republicans have concerns over whether 10 years after September 11th, uh, some of these me uh, measures that critics say are uh, uh, in infringement on uh, privacy rights and give the government too much power, uh, whether they're still needed and whether they're warranted. And so we're going to see some debate on that. The, uh, the House Republican leadership has been whipping this vote um, more aggressively than it did uh, the last time, and they're pretty confident that they will uh, be able to, to pass um, you know, the version that comes out of the Senate. You attended a briefing today with House Majority Leader Eric Cantor, Republican from Virginia. What did he discuss with reporters in that briefing? 
he discussed the uh, the agenda that we've just discussed for the week, and he also he made some news actually on the political front when he was asked. Um, uh, there's been obviously a lot of talk about the Paul Ryan budget, and it's been made into quite uh, the political lightning rod. Uh, he was asked if Paul Ryan, the budget committee chairman, should run for president, and he said sure, uh, and that Paul Ryan is a uh, is a real leader and, and is about real leadership. And so that made some news because there has been some talk about Paul Ryan jumping into the race. Um, Eric Cantor also talked a little bit about um, Israel with the prime minister's uh, uh, speech coming up to Congress uh, tomorrow. And he also talked about the fact that the House Republicans are going to be unveiling what they call a growth agenda later this week, likely on Thursday, which will be um, a collection of bills aimed at reducing uh, government regulation, which has been uh, has long been a promise of theirs, and aimed at um, boosting uh, job creation. The Republicans have taken some flack from Democrats for being too focused on cutting spending and not enough about actually uh, growing jobs. Russell Berman of The Hill, we appreciate your time. Thanks so much. are 385, the nays are 1, two-thirds being in the affirmative. The rules are suspended and the bill is passed and without objection the motion to reconsider is laid upon the table. For what purpose does the gentleman from Missouri rise? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I ask unanimous consent to be removed as a co-sponsor from H.R. 1380. Without objection, so ordered. The House will be in order. Please remove conversations from the floor. The House will be in order. Will members please clear the well? We're doing one minute. The chair is prepared to entertain one minute requests. For what purpose does the gentleman from South Carolina rise? Without objection, the gentleman will suspend. The House will be in order. <coughs> Gentlemen, is recognized. Mr. Speaker, in the last two years, the price of gasoline by gallon has more than doubled. During his campaign, the president promised to skyrocket energy costs, and that's exactly what's happened. House Republicans are leading the way in implementing a sound domestic energy plan aimed to reduce gas prices. This plan seeks to expand domestic energy production while creating jobs here in America. Republicans in the House have successfully passed the Starting American Offshore Leasing Now Act. This bill provides immediate relief at the gas pump while creating jobs for Americans. It will increase domestic energy production and create jobs by conducting oil and natural gas lease sales. House Republicans are addressing the need for more immediate relief from rising prices at the pump along with the long-term vision of a domestic energy policy plan. We need to work together for an all-American, all-above American energy plan. In conclusion, God bless our troops who will never forget September 11th and the global war on terrorism. My sympathy to the family of Richard Brian Wilson, a dedicated patriot from Columbia, South Carolina. Gentlemen's time has expired. For what purpose, gentlemen from Texas rise? 
The gentlelady is recognized for one minute. Speaker, as we begin this week and look to the memorializing of our fallen soldiers, it's appropriate uh, to always thank them and to be reminded of the historic actions that brought down Osama bin Laden. But the country that this incident occurred is a country that deserves peace for its people. Pakistan has had another incident of the Taliban going on one of the bases and killing soldiers. Our sympathy to the loss of the innocent, but we call upon the Pakistani military and the civilian government to begin to address the terror of the Taliban and to work to help the Pakistani people. As the Terry Luger money is being assessed as to how it's to be distributed for social needs, there must be an addressing of this violence. And so I call upon our friends in Pakistan to recognize that we in the United States are friends, but we must work together to eliminate al-Qaeda and the terror that is terrorizing the people of Pakistan once and for all. There must be a unified effort to establish peace and tranquility and democracy in Pakistan for the people of Pakistan. I yield back. The gentlelady's time has expired. For what purpose does the gentleman from Texas rise? Request permission to address the House for one minute. The gentleman is recognized for one minute. Mr. Speaker, in a failed attempt to play Solomon, the President has decided to split the nation of Israel in two. He wants Israel to give away more land to the Palestinians in the name of peace. Israel has a history of giving up land and still has no peace. The President's proposal would make Israel a land it could not defend. Prime Minister Netanyahu has said net to the President. And where does the United States get the omnipotent power to tell any country that it should give away part of their sovereign land? What if Netanyahu told us that the United States should divide up our land and swap it among our citizens? We would not stand for such. The conflict between Israel and the Palestinians must be resolved between the two groups. The U.S. government should not take the side of the Palestinians over our ally, Israel. Such act action lacks wisdom and shows contempt for the people of Israel. And that's just the way it is. The gentleman's time has expired. For what purpose does the gentleman from North Dakota rise? The gentleman's recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Today I'd like to congratulate Brandt Holdings, a Fargo-based company, who recently received the prestigious E Award. The E Award is the highest award the U.S. government gives in recognition of an American entity and its relationship to trade. North Dakota is no stranger to the benefits of trade. In the past year, exports have grown over 15 percent in North Dakota. And since the founding of our trade office six years ago, exports have nearly tripled. Founded in 1992, Brandt Holdings Company has also become and had a steady path of growth. With consolidated offices in Fargo, North Dakota, the company is diversified and now operates in four divisions, agricultural, construction, real estate, and the entertainment division. I applaud Brandt Holding Companies for their efforts to increase trade in North Dakota and also for the rest of our country. And I congratulate them on receiving this prestigious award. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I yield the remainder of my time. Gentleman's time has expired. For what purpose does the gentleman from Minnesota rise? Gentleman is recognized for one minute. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to congratulate Hopkins boys basketball coach Ken Novak, Jr. on being named ESPN Rises National Coach of the Year after leading the Hopkins Royals to their third straight state championship title. Now, for Ken, Jr., coaching basketball at Hopkins is a family business of sorts. His father, Ken, Sr., coached the Hopkins Royal for 19 years, including his son. But in 1990, Ken, Jr. stepped into his father's shoes and began coaching at Hopkins. In 22 seasons as head coach for the Royals, Coach Novak would lead the team to a record of 542-74 to 74 and six state titles. Since returning to his alma mater, Coach Novak turned Hopkins into a basketball powerhouse that had won only two state titles before his arrival. Congratulations, Coach Novak, on winning ESPN's Rises Coach of the Year title and for leading such outstanding student-athletes. I yield back. Gentleman's time is what purpose the gentleman from Illinois rise? Address the House for one minute, revise and extend my remarks. The gentleman is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise to congratulate the Providence St. Mayor High School, 
small high school on the block where I used to live that sends all of its young people to college and have been doing so for the last 20 years. I congratulate its principal, Dr. Paul Adams, all of the students and their families, Providence St. Mail. What a way to go. The gentleman from California is recognized for one minute. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Today, the United States Supreme Court delivered a body blow to the safety of the people of my home state of California. Today, in an unprecedented action of judicial intemperance, the United States Supreme Court basically ordered that between 38,000 and 46,000 prisoners currently in the California prison system be released. Many times, Supreme Court decisions are, are of mere academic interest. This one specifically deals with the safety of the people of my home state. As one who led uh, a team of attorneys generals of the states of the nation in the 90s to have prison litigation reform, which was incorporated into a law that was passed by the Congress and signed by the President, this flies in the face of every piece of that bill. You, don't rarely, you rarely say this, but I fear that there will be murders there will be rapes, there will be assaults, there will be unnamed and unnumbered crimes in my home state as a direct result of today's decision by the U.S. Supreme Court. Since when did they take over all of the three branches of government, becoming the executive branch, the legislative branch, and the judicial branch? The chair lays before the House the following enrolled bill. H.R. 793, an act to designate the facility of the United States Postal Service located at 12781 Sir Francis Drake Boulevard in Iverness, California as the specialist Jake Robert Velanoza Post Office. The chair lays before the House a communication. The Honorable the Speaker, House of Representatives, Sir, pursuant to the permission granted in Clause 2H of Rule 2 of the Rules of the U.S. House of Representatives, I have the honor to transmit a sealed envelope received from the White House on May 23, 2011 at 5.15 p.m. and said to contain a message from the President whereby he submits a copy of an executive order he has issued with respect to further sanctions on Iran. With best wishes, I am signed sincerely, Karen L. Haas, Clerk of the House. Clerk will read the message. To the Congress of the United States, pursuant to the International Emergency Economic Powers Act, I hereby report that I have issued an executive order that takes additional steps with respect to the national emergency declared in Executive Order 12957 of March 15, 1995 and implements the existing statutory requirements of the Iran Sanctions Act of 1996, as amended by inter alia the Comprehensive Iran Sanctions, Accountability and Divestment Act of 2010, Public Law 111-195. This order is intended to implement the statutory requirements of ISA. Certain ISA sanctions require action by the private sector, and the order will further the implementation of those ISA sanctions by providing authority under IEEPA to the Secretary of the Treasury to take certain actions with respect to those sanctions. I have delegated to the Secretary of the Treasury the authority in consultation with the Secretary of State to take such actions including the promulgation of rules and regulations and to employ all powers granted to the President by IEEPA and the relevant provisions of ISA and to employ all powers granted to the United States government by the relevant provision of ISA as may be necessary to carry out the purposes of the order. All executive agencies of the United States government are directed to take all appropriate measures within their authority to carry out the provisions of the order. I am enclosing a copy of the executive order I have issued, signed Barack Obama, the White House, May 23, 2011.
referred to the Committee on Foreign Affairs and order printed. Gentlemen, what uh, purpose should arise? Texas recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm about to file a bill. Its uh, number will be determined later, but it expresses support for the State of Israel's right to defend Israeli sovereignty, to protect the lives and safety of the Israeli people, and to use all means necessary to confront and eliminate <laughs> nuclear threats posed by the Islamic Republic of Iran, including the use of military force if no other peaceful solution can be found within a reasonable time to protect against such immediate and immediate and existential threat to the state of Israel. We have a president who doesn't know history as well as he should, or he would be aware that last Thursday, instead of saying, with his spokesman, I guess, uh, saying, gee, this was the starting point for all negotiations. Actually, the facts are that the Clinton administration pushed Prime Minister Barack into basically that proposal and it's my belief that just as I believe that God hardened the heart of Pharaoh when Moses made his request, he hardened Arafat's heart, he rejected the offer and it does not need to be made again. With that, I yield back my time. Chair lays before the House the following personal request. Leaves of absence requested for Mr. Ellison of Minnesota for today, Mr. Freelingheising of New Jersey for today, Mr. Hastings of Washington for today, and the balance of the week, Mr. Inahosa of Texas for today, Ms. McCollum of Minnesota for today, and Mr. Markey of Min Massachusetts for today, Ms. Napolitano of California for today, Mr. Pastor of Arizona for today, and Tuesday, May 24, and Ms. Sutton of Ohio for today. With that objection, the question request are granted. Under the Speaker's announced policy of January 5, 2011, the gentlewoman from the 6th District, Ms. Virgin Islands. Uh, from, I'm sorry, from Vermont. From the Virgin Islands, Ms. Christensen, apologize, is recognized for 60 minutes as a designee for the minority leader. Thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and um, I'm pleased to lead the Congressional Black Caucus in the, uh, this hour to talk about jobs and the need for job creation in communities across this country. And before I begin, I'd like to ask Mr. Speaker unanimous consent that all members may have five le legislative days in which to revise and extend their remarks and include extraneous material on the subject of this uh, special order, which is jobs. You know, amid reports of improvement in the economy and um, the April jobs report was one of those examples, we were in a steady if slow recovery, but that recovery has not been felt by the millions of Americans who are out of work or who are working in jobs that are well below their potential. And no more is the pain of the recession felt than in the African American community where unemployment is high in good times but now remains the highest of all population groups in this country at 16.1%. And so along with saving homes, job creation remains a primary focus of the Congressional Black Caucus and of House Democrats. We are determined to build on the more than 3 million jobs created or saved by the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. And so a key part of this effort, before we left for last week's constituent work period, House Democrats launched our Make It in America agenda, which we wholeheartedly support. Over the past three years, we have passed legislation to prevent multinational corporations from outsourcing jobs overseas, to give tax credits to small businesses, to hire new employees, to restore uh, the credit to small businesses because they are the engine of our economy and of job creation. Our Make It in America agenda continues and expands on that effort by a number of pieces of legislation introduced by members of the Democratic Caucus. Legislation to support developing a national strategy to increase manufacturing, 
to invest in infrastructure and support the flow of commerce, to keep our country competitive in the global marketplace, to further support small business, to develop an innovative education policy, and to put smart regulations in place which protect our people and our environment while improving government efficiency. Democrats have already introduced bills to further these goals, and we're calling on the Republican leadership to end the assaults on health care reform and the blocking of the green economy we need to build, asking them to support both of these important pillars of President Obama's agenda, which will create jobs, and I ask them to bring our job-creating legislation to the floor. At this time, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to yield such time as he might consume to the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Congressman David Scott. Thank you very much, um, and I want to commend you, uh, Congressman Lady Christensen, for your leadership and for what you're doing. Uh, ladies and gentlemen of America in this Congress, our economy is struggling. And nowhere is it struggling more than in the area of unemployment and joblessness. And correspondingly, with home foreclosures and the value of our housing stock going down. Those are the two very serious points on the compass that we have got to declare an emergency situation on. Because they're both so very related. If a man does not have a job or a young lady does not have a job, how can they stay in their home? And so I want to just talk for just uh, a few minutes about one, how, how you, you really can't figure how to get out of a situation unless you stop and you think of how you got into it. The one thing I've noticed about people who have lost their sight, they may need a little help as they come to get into a room. But I tell you, that person without his sight feels his way of how he got into that room. And how he gets out of that room, he can feel his way back out. So it might do well for us just to pause for a moment and we go back to our economic downturn, there were some failures that we made. We rushed, rightfully so in many respects, to bail out Wall Street, to bail out America's big business structure. We did that. We had to unfreeze the credit markets on Wall Street in order to keep it moving. But if there's one thing we learned from our previous very challenging economic difficulties, and the most recent one being the Depression. We got out of that Depression by not only making sure that our big companies, making sure that Wall Street and our bankers and our investors and our multinational corporations were able to survive. Our failure was that we did nothing to help Main Street at the same time. And the one thing we learned in depression is, yes, you got to do both. You got to put money up at the top, you got to put it in the middle of the economic stream, and at the lower end of the economic stream because you have to get people spending money. Jobs are created when people spend money. We are a mass consumption society which means our economy moves not on the wealthy being able to go buy a car. Our economy moves on being thousands and millions of people being able to buy the car, to buy the clothes, to buy the food in the restaurants. Our failure to do that. And so we had a top-down economic recovery instead of a top, middle, and bottom at the same time. So here we are. And that's why right now our multi-corporations are having staggering profits. Our CEOs are making huge salaries and bonuses. All that we help. And I don't, I don't begrudge them. I, I, I am a believer in capitalism. I, graduated from the Citadel of Capitalism, the Wharton School of Finance. I'm a businessman, so I don't begrudge that. But what I do begrudge is our failure to help the little fellow. Now, 
We're beginning to do that. But what we must do is realize that all of this time, we're in this recovery now, almost three years. And we have 13 million Americans without work. We have a national unemployment of 8.7 is coming down. Some of our policies are working. In my own state of Georgia, our unemployment rate is a staggering 9.9%. 563 Georgians are without work. And so that means that we're not doing enough. There are certain areas we can work in. For example, we need to evaluate the programs that we say we have put out there to help with the unemployment level. Now we know we have put a program together which will give corporations a 6% reduction or reduction of their part of the payroll tax if they hire an unemployed person. Well, well where's the report card on that? How, how is that doing? That's one of the things that we need to get. We need measurement to see how successful it really is. We need to also look to the future and look at what policies we can put together with corporations because what we're doing is not enough. I would submit that wouldn't it be interesting and wouldn't it be worthy of consideration? We know, for example, that we have the just about the highest corporate tax rate in the world. Clearly, our multinational, our largest corporations, our largest employers want to see that corporate tax rate come down. Many want it to come down to 25%. I am on the side of taking a look at that because we don't want to have the highest corporate tax rate in the world it hurts our marketplace, it hurts everything. We know that, that is an issue. But what we must do, if we know these multinational corporations are having a record now of outsourcing jobs, should not we have a conversation with them at the table? Okay, you want your corporate tax rate reduced? Let's talk about how you can stop sending jobs out of this country. We need Americans who are working at American jobs in America. I, I, I think that, the, that these large employers and corporations with these international markets would be willing to sit down and say, you know what, in exchange for us uh, getting our corporate tax rate down, here's what we can do to start bringing in our manufacturing and bring it back to America so that we can make things in America. One of the reasons why we got such a high jobless rate is because we don't make anything here anymore. Manufacturing is the main source of jobs. We lost that. Well, we can use this as an incentive to these companies. Say, okay, we can bring that corporate tax rate down, but we want you to bring those jobs back here and we want you to start making things in this country. Let's look out for America. Look out for us. That is something that we can do. And um, so, 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 Madam uh, Congress Lady from the Virgin Islands, you're doing a wonderful job with this. This is the number one issue facing this country. I can't tell you how desperate people become when they can't find work. I, I can't tell you how depressed people come when people are used to working and they wake up every morning with no place to go or they have to make certain decisions and some can't find food or buy the food to feed their families. That is the situation we're in with these 13 million American people and we can do better. We've got to evaluate what we're doing 
and we've got to put more creative things on the table, such as the corporate tax rate. Tie that. Let us tie that to corporations bringing these jobs back and doing what they can to help turn our country back into a manufacturing base. When you lose your capacity, when this country lost its capacity to be the leader of the world in making things, we lost a lot. And by George, we need to get it back. And that's the way America will survive, and that's the way we'll bring this unemployment rate down. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, thank you Congressman Scott, and um, I thank you for calling attention to the need to um, restore manufact the manufacturing base in this country, as the Democrats are attempting to do with our Make It in America agenda. And thank you for reminding everyone that Main Street is still not taken care of and that there's a critical connection between the jobs crisis and the housing crisis and why they need to be dealt with now as an emergency. And I would just call on our leadership, the Republican leadership, to, you know, let's stop trying to um, unravel President Obama's agenda, which is an agenda that creates jobs. We've been here now for almost five months, and not one job has been created by any legislation that the majority has brought to the floor. Uh, it's time to get busy. Main Street is calling on us, and at this point I'd like to yield such time as he might consume to the gentleman from Illinois, Congressman Danny Davis. Thank you very much, and uh, let me first of all commend you for the tremendous leadership that you provide to this effort each Monday evening. Uh, you know, as I was thinking about it, I was thinking of the fact that people who observe racing oftentimes describe horses in two ways. They say sometimes there's a show horse, and then there's a work horse. Mm -hmm. and I guess when it comes to working as a member of Congress, I don't think you have any peer. As a matter <laughs> of fact, you have led right. our efforts. We came into the Congress at the same time. We're classmates. And you've led our efforts on health care. You've led our efforts on making sure that natural resources were divided in a serious way, and you're leading our efforts as the first vice chairman of the Congressional Black Caucus, and so I'm pleased to join with you this evening. You know, as we consider policies to help Americans and our nation recover from the worst economic crisis in our history, and I never forget this gentleman, but I remember something that Dr. Martin Luther King said at one time. And he said that the ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort, but where he stands at times of challenge and controversy. I agree with him. This is indeed a time of challenge for our country. With the current unemployment rate of 9.9% and expected rate over 8% for the next several years, and record levels of food insecurity and foreclosures. As in many other states, the average unemployment rate in Illinois during 2010 for blacks was above 15 percent, above 13 percent for Latinos. And with persistently high unemployment numbers, the need for federal unemployment assistance remains a vital lifeline for millions of our citizens. In January of 2011, the share of unemployed workers who had been without work for over six months was 43.8 percent, one of the highest percentages on record, translating into about 6.2 million workers remaining unemployed for longer than six months. In April 2011, just under 185,000 Illinoisans received extended unemployment benefits, with an estimated 100,000 Illinoisans exhausting the maximum 99 weeks of unemployment assistance in 2010. Although our economy is gradually gaining, we cannot ignore the fact 
that the economic crisis remains a daily reality for millions of Americans, nor can we ignore the fact that the crisis unevenly affects African American and Latino Americans. During times of challenge, I sincerely believe that the mantle of responsibility for caring for the poor and struggling falls squarely on the shoulders of government, not primarily on the charity of individual citizens. In such times of hardship and strife, government leaders should extend help to the needy, not advance the wealth of the most secure. For this reason, I am deeply disappointed in the Republican bill moving in the House that would hurt both our economy and the long-term unemployed, some of the most vulnerable citizens in our nation. The Republican plan would essentially curtail assistance to Americans struggling with prolonged unemployment so that states could lower their debt to the federal government. This approach is bad for the economy and bad for Americans. Unemployment insurance is one of the most effective methods of stimulating the economy because the unemployed workers spend most of the money that they get on critical purchases such as food and housing other than the alternatives offered by the Republican bill. If we allow this $31 billion to go to state debt reduction, there is no new economic activity and millions of families will not be able to put food on their table or roofs over their heads. It is not only the four million workers who currently receive long-term unemployment benefits who will suffer, it is our businesses as well. The retail sector has been hard hit by this recession. Cutting unemployment benefits for millions of people would take a tremendous toll on these businesses as well. The Congressional Budget Office estimates that current law generates approximately $40 billion in economic activity and creates about 322,000 jobs. Enacting the Republican approach would dramatically reduce the economic stimulus of our federal government and cut jobs. Unemployment benefits only provide on an average of $290 a week, which typically replaces only half of the average family's expenses. This support is not a free ride or boon for families. It is a critical lifeline during a national emergency to help our citizens who are suffering. The Wall Street Journal reported that roughly one million people across the nation couldn't find work after exhausting their unemployment benefits. There are about seven million fewer jobs now than at the beginning of the Great Recession, and the Department of Labor data show that there are over four unemployed Americans for every job. Needing unemployment assistance is about not being able to find work in a weak economy with limited job opportunities, and it's not about being lazy. The Republican bill is not a jobs bill. It is a jilting the jobless bill. It pits states that are struggling with large deficits against the millions of Americans who have lost their jobs through no fault of their own. I urge that we continue the fight to secure improvements in this proposal to protect the hundreds of millions of hard-working Americans who need the government's help to weather the extended storm of economic hardship. I commend you again for your tremendous leadership. Thank you very much for leading this effort and yield back my time. And thank you, Congressman Davis, for joining us this evening, and thank you for your kind words, but I am very proud to be a part of a Congressional Black Caucus that is made up of 43 workhorses, and just glad to be able to work along with all of them. And thank you for calling attention to the need to extend unemployment benefits to the many who are still without a job. The jobs are not, just not there, and the Republican majority is not creating any. 
We need to continue this lifeline to our families and to the communities that they live in. So thank you for raising that issue again. Thank you. Uh, at this time, I'd like to yield such time as he might consume to the gentleman from Virginia, Congressman Bobby Scott. Thank you. Thank you. And I appreciate you yielding time and appreciate you bringing to the attention of the American public the need for continued uh, support for those who are unemployed. The current economic climate has taken a toll, taken a toll on many families across the nation. And while the economy may be growing, there's still almost 14 million unemployed people nationally, and the unemployment rate is hovering at 9 percent. We need to take serious steps to address this crisis and create policies that create, that create jobs. From a long-term perspective, we need to be investing in, uh, in our workforce by investing in education and job training, through early beginning with early childhood education and continuing through college and vocational education, as well as adult education and training. Unfortunately, the Republican budget makes huge cuts in our nation's education system by cutting investments in education by over 50 percent and zeroing out many job training uh, investments. Uh, these cuts include services such as elementary and secondary education, educational innovation, career and technical education, cuts to community colleges, and post-secondary education. The budget also cuts the maximum Pell Grant a vital program that makes college affordable for young students and takes away eligibility for over, a million, for over a million students. And so we should be trying to work to get people back to work and increase innova innovation, so we ought to be actually be spending more, not less. But with these cuts, fewer people will have access to education and training that they need to fuel the economic pro productivity and compete for the good jobs that are occurring in our labor market today. So on a long-term basis, we need to ensure that we're building a strong and capable workforce. In the short term, we need to make sure that people who have lost their jobs during the recession are not left out in the cold. Currently, there, for, every one job, uh, for every one job opening, there are over four people applying for jobs. Now, this means that whatever the job applicants do to help themselves, there'll still be many people left out in the cold. To add insult to injury, many applicants are not getting consideration for jobs because they have been unemployed for too long. Many employers will screen applicants and require that they are holding a job to be, com to be considered for a new job. If they find out that you're unemployed, many employers will not consider them for, for employment. So those who are looking for a job and have been looking for a job for a long time find that it's even harder to find a job and these are the people that um, have been unemployed for 60, 90, or even 99 weeks. They're dejected and being cut off from unemployment insurance and not giving a fair shot at a job that they're applying for. Our focus should be particularly on how to, uh, how, what to do about the long-term unemployed and keep, the, keep, um, uh, keep them on their feet. Uh, in February, Congresswoman uh, Barbara Lee from California and I introduced the Emergency Unemployment Compensation Extension Act to provide 14 additional weeks of unemployment compensation for the chronically unemployed so that they can stay afloat during their jobs, job search at least until our recession is over and jobs have returned. The Emergency Unemployment Compensation Act would, if passed, give these hardworking Americans a little more time to find a job without having to worry about having making ends meet. Now we have to note that receipt of unemployment compensation is, in, is conditioned first on the fact that you lost your job through no fault of your own and that you are actively and actively looking for a job and will accept a reasonable job and so these are conditions of receiving unemployment compensation. Uh, unfortunately this uh, compassionate bill has been stalled in committee and the a majority of the House has not taken action on it. To make matters worse, just uh, a few weeks ago, a new bill has been introduced in the House which will actually weaken the unemployment compensation program. They call it the Jobs Opportunity Benefits and Services Act. They call it the Jobs Act. And it would allow states to divert federal funds they receive to pay for unemployment compensation to other purposes, including tax cuts. Hmm. Uh, jobs, that jobs so-called Jobs Act will essentially allow states to terminate payment of unemployment benefits 
potentially eliminating $40 billion in economic activity, according to CBO estimates. So not only are, we, are they failing to extend benefits during a time of constant high unemployment, uh, some now want to cut off uh, benefits altogether. Uh, critics of the unemployment compensation believe that providing unemployment benefits will give people an incentive not to work, that people receiving unemployment compensations will, will merely collect the benefits as long as they have can without looking for a job, but a condition of receiving the benefits. One of the conditions is you have to be actively looking for a job. And while that criticism uh, uh, may apply to a few bad apples, the overwhelming majority of Americans who are chronically unemployed would rather enjoy the dignity of work instead of collecting a, a weekly check from the government, many of which many of these checks on a national average uh, will average $260 a week, clearly not enough for a family mm -hmm. to survive. The overwhelming majority of chronically unemployed do not want a handout. They would like a job. And while the, the, we have the, and while unemployment compensation helps the unemployed, unemployment benefits also help the economy. Economists estimate that in the U.S. economy, uh, grow, the U.S. economy grows by $1.61 for every dollar the government spends on unemployment compensation because unemployed people will obviously spend every dime right away. This is in stark contrast to the economic activity generated by tax cuts, which in many, many of the tax cuts will generate about 17 cents of economic activity for every dollar of tax cuts. Uh, this is $1.61 for every dollar in unemployment compensation. So simply put, the unemployment compensation is one of the most effective and efficient ways to stimulate the economy, and we should be focusing on providing this kind of support and stimulus to the economy in conjunction with making bold investments in our education system and our workforce. Uh, we need to make uh, sure that we make those long-term investments in education and job training. We also need to make sure that we have a compassionate short-term solution by providing the safety net for millions of Americans who lost their job through no fault of their own and haven't found a job yet. Uh, these jobs just don't exist. And we also um, have to oppose the elimination of unemployment compensation by redirecting those funds to whatever the states may want, including tax cuts. That is simply wrong. So I thank you for pointing out the need for the unemployment compensation program to continue and even be improved and oppose those initiatives that want to sabotage the unemployment compensation system. I yield back. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman Scott, and thank you for reminding us that we're really not out of a recession, and uh, this is a time to, where we need to invest in, to continue those unemployment benefits. And thank you for talking about the people who are unemployed. We hear so many m misconceptions spread about people who are uh, receiving unemployment. They really do need, would prefer to have a job. They are actively looking, as you've pointed out, to, to be able to receive those unemployment benefits. And it's a shame the way that some of our colleagues speak about people who are really trying to find a job where there are no jobs to be found and need that extra help. So I really appreciate your coming and joining us this evening. And one of the other things that the Congressional Black Caucus has been uh, advocating for is summer jobs for our young people. Uh, it's important for us to have meaningful, uh, to have them meaningfully occupied and employed during that summer vacation. And uh, it seems like we're going back to what we used to have to do in the previous administration and, you know, keep begging and begging for summer jobs for our, our, our young people. It's, it's critically important. I also don't understand why there's so much objection uh, to our building a green economy. Uh, if we don't, we'll be left behind the rest of the world in this important sector. Creating that economy uh, would build on the tens of thousands of jobs that were created with the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, moving, uh, and moving from to renewable energy and the jobs that that will create is good for our environment, it will slow uh, climate change, it is good for our health, and it's good for our economy. It would build jobs, sustainable jobs, and help us to build a strong and more sustainable economy for the future. It's good for profit, it's good for the planet, and it's good for people. I want to just talk a little bit about the 
Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act because I have a gentleman to yield before she goes sure, on to the um, next I issue because it's so, yield. it's uh, so important uh, that you mentioned summer jobs and opportunities. Uh, they get help get young people on the right track and keep them on the right track, get them used to a uh, working environment uh, and get them set for their future life. But also um, uh, with so many people unemployed today in the construction area mm -hmm. and at a time when we have trillions of dollars in needs in terms of roads and bridges and tunnels and other infrastructure projects, uh, this is a time where we really ought to be investing in those for our future. Uh, those projects would, would be coming in. Uh, the bids on those projects would be at the lowest they've been historically. Uh, so that as you pay for them over the course of time with bonds, you'll be paying at a much lower rate. Uh, and those needs are certainly there today. Absolutely. So um, we need to make those investments in job creation in terms of roads and bridges and other infrastructure. It's a great time to do it, and the people need those jobs. Thank, Thank you. you for adding that um, issue to the, to the discussion this evening. Um, and let me just go back to the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, because despite its immediate and projected successes, uh, our friends on the other side of the aisle continue their efforts to repeal and underfund the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. Despite the rhetoric to the contrary, this new law lifts more than 30 million Americans out of the ranks of the uninsured, protects the health care consumer from unjust practices that have occurred in our health care system for far too many decades, and preserves and improves the health, health care, and thus wellness of some of our nation's most vulnerable re residents, our children and our seniors. My colleagues and I have and will continue to highlight the deleterious health consequences that would result if these attacks on health care reform ever moved from a policy proposal to enactment, and we will continue to oppose any, uh, any um, attempt to undermine this important law. It's critically important to remember, though, also, that while repealing health care reform will have very obvious very negative impacts on health and wellness, repeal of any part of the law created by the Affordable Care Act will also have an equally horrendous impact on the economy and more directly on jobs. The data is in, it's indisputable. There is no evidence that health care reform hurts or eliminates jobs. In fact, since the health care reform bill was passed in March of last year, there has been private sector growth month after month after month, leading to the creation of a total of 1.4 million new private sector jobs, and, and we're counting. Further, of these 1.4 million new jobs that were created, both directly and indirectly from health care reform, 243,000 of them, almost a quarter of a million of them are directly in the healthcare sector. And all of this job growth and job expansion has occurred in just one year. While that's good news, there was even better news that came out of a recent study out of Harvard University which found that healthcare reform as uh, enacted by the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act would create up to four million jobs over the next 10 years. Compare that to eight years of policies under the previous administration that literally eliminated 673,000 private sector jobs, while at the same time exacerbating our nation's plight with uninsurance, spiraling health care costs, and worsening health disparities. And once you make the comparison, ask yourself which policies are truly better for American jobs? for the American economy, for the health and wellness of Americans, and for the nation as a whole. It is, is repealing health care reform better when we know that the repeal not only would increase medical spending, the re repeal would increase medical spending by $125 billion by the end of this decade and increase family insurance pre premiums by nearly 2,000 every year but it will also destroy as many as 400,000 jobs every year over the next decade. The answer is simply no. We need to stay on this path, one with an upward trajectory, because it is the path that not only includes a reformed, transformed health care system, but it's also a path that creates jobs, lowers our unemployment rate, and saves employers, both large and small, money that they can reinvest by creating additional jobs for millions of Americans. It is the path that we've been hoping to find. It's the path that we struggle to get on. And now that we're on it, it's a this time. I just want to reiterate that we've been here for almost five months. Nothing that has come to this floor has created jobs. Communities like mine and communities like 
that most of my colleagues represent in, in this body still have high unemployment. There are no jobs. We need to continue the un to provide unemployment insurance. We need to work to begin to create the jobs that the people of America need. So with that, I'd like to yield back the balance of my time. Under the Speaker's announced policy of January 5, 2011, the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Gowdy, is recognized for 60 minutes as the designee of the Majority Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, last week, uh, of course, we were in our respective districts, which means I was home in my beloved state of South Carolina. And while the bulk of that time was spent in the upstate, in Greenville, Spartanburg, and Union counties, uh, South Carolina is such a small state with a deep and rich tie uh, throughout the various regions of the state uh, that even in the course of one week, Mr. Speaker, I was able to go to all six congressional districts in South Carolina at one point or another. South Carolina is full of natural beauty from the mountains of the upstate to the beaches of our coastal region. South Carolina is home to hardworking, loyal, kind-hearted, and resilient people. We have wonderful schools, a world-class port, vibrant research universities, highly regarded hospitals and medical centers. We have a depth and breadth of assets throughout the state of South Carolina, as well as the small businesses that are the backbone of this country and this economy. Mr. Speaker, South Carolina is among the first states to help other states when calamity strikes. We have a rich history of fighting and sacrificing, indeed dying for this country. We are proud and brave and we are not easily intimidated. Which brings me to the National Labor Relations Board and its recent interactions with the state of South Carolina. At a time when union membership is at a historic low, unions seek to influence this administration in a historically high fashion. At a time when this nation needs to come together and face the great challenges of our time, there are those in this administration who seek to benefit from the politics of class, generational, and now regional conflict. From a Secretary of Health and Human Services who claimed that our colleague Paul Ryan's efforts to reform Medicare would call seniors to die sooner when it is a demonstrably false statement, indeed an abomination to say something so overtly political about a courageous colleague who has the foresight to try to save Medicare. From that to the NLRB and its general counsel and their efforts to intimidate the state of South Carolina not once but twice with threatened lawsuits and now a complaint when a company decides to put an additional line of work in the great state of South Carolina. Boeing decided to build some of its new 787 Dreamliners in South Carolina. And nearly a year, Mr. Speaker, after the decision was made and construction had begun and in some instances been completed, after South Carolina workers received the good news that jobs were finally headed our way, the National Labor Relations Board decided to file a complaint. And it's important to keep in mind what is not at issue. There is no merit to the contention that Boeing did not negotiate in good faith with the union over the placement of a second line of work in South Carolina. No one seriously contends that. And incredibly, there's no evidence that existing jobs will move from Washington State to South Carolina. Instead, the NLRB seeks to tell companies where it can and cannot build additional lines of work. Let that sink in for a moment. The National Labor Relations Board seeks to tell a company where it can and cannot build additional lines of work. So be forewarned, if you build a plant or a facility in a union state, there is the prospect that you will never be able to leave again if the NLRB has its way. And the law is clear, indeed it is crystal clear, employers are permitted to make predictions on future economic circumstances so long as the circumstances are demonstrably predictable. 
So is it predictable that there would be labor shortages and stoppages in Washington State? Well, Mr. Speaker, there have been four strikes since 1989 in, Washington, in the Washington State facility for Boeing, all of which supports the movement of the entire 787 production line to South Carolina, but that's not what Boeing is doing. And I would commend, Mr. Speaker, the reading of the comments by a Boeing customer who said that the continued threatened work stoppages are causing it to reconsider whether or not it wants to do business with Boeing, and yet Boeing is not supposed to consider that when they decide where to build additional lines of work. Indeed, make no mistake, Mr. Speaker, there will be two planes made in Washington State for every one plane made in South Carolina, but that is not enough for this administration. They want to control where businesses can locate, what they can make, and how much of it they can make. I want you to consider, Mr. Speaker, the comments of the NLRB spokesperson. And I quote, We are not telling Boeing, that Boeing they cannot make planes in South Carolina. We are talking about one specific line of work, three planes a month. If they keep three planes a month in Washington, there is no problem. Really? The National Labor Relations Board is going to tell Boeing how many planes it can make and in what state and what constitutes a problem and what doesn't constitute a problem. To my colleagues from the South Carolina delegation who have labeled this an unprecedented act, they are entirely correct. So what it appears now, Mr. Speaker, is that this administration and the National Labor Relations Board will elevate the unions to the same status as the employer, that all future decisions have to be made in concert, and if the unions object to a line of work that is separate and distinct being moved to a right-to-work state like South Carolina, it cannot be done. Mr. Speaker, I see that I have been joined by my distinguished colleague from the 5th Congressional District, Mr. Mulvaney. And, Mr. Speaker, I would seek to yield such time as Mr. Mulvaney may consume. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And a thank you to my colleague, Mr. Gowdy. Uh, his words are, are well considered and well made, and I think bear out the decision of the people of, the, of his district to send him to Washington. This is perhaps the first real challenge we face together as a team here in, in, in Washington, and I'm a proud to be a member of this team as we take on uh, perhaps the, the critical issue of our day in our state when it comes to economic development and job growth. I want to do something that we are not very good at uh, in South Carolina when it comes to these types of issues. I want to speak bluntly. Um, ordinarily, we don't talk about uncomfortable things in our state very bluntly. We, we are more southerly and gentlemanly about it than I'm going to be for the next few minutes. Uh, but I feel compelled to do that by the circumstances that face us. I want to talk very briefly about what this says about the current administration's attitude towards business. And then I want to talk very briefly about why people, not only in South Carolina, but people all over this country should be concerned with this lawsuit against Boeing by the NLRB. Regarding the administration's attitude towards business, I, I talked several times uh, when I was running for this office uh, with folks in my district about another issue. At that time, it was cap and trade. And I remember coming across an employer in my district who I never thought would be in favor of that particular piece of legislation, but who had signed on and actually contributed financially towards advancing that particular initiative. And I remember talking to them and asking them why this was. Why were they doing something that was so clearly against their self-interest? And they told me that it had been very, made very plain to them that if they did not get on board, that they would have a visit from the EPA. And that wasn't it much better for them to participate in the cap-and-trade legislation uh, than it was to get run over and visited by the EPA, to have someone come down and bring down the full regulatory authority of the government on you without any recourse whatsoever? Wouldn't you rather be sitting at the table to, to, to design part of your own demise rather than have it dealt fully in your face uh, by the regulatory arm of the administration? Frightened me to death. Frightened me to death that that is what we had come to in this nation. I call it, and I still do, I call it to this day, and I know people don't, uh, uh, this frustrates people and bothers some people when I call it this, it is government by mafia. 
It really is. It's like walking into an office and going, wow, it would be a real shame if this place burnt down tomorrow. Why don't you come and give us a little bit of money to help us in our cause and we'll make sure nothing bad happens to you. It frightens me and it disgusts me that this is the way the government treats its own people. I, I cannot help but think of that example uh, as I sit here and look at what the NLRB is doing uh, these days. To come to the Boeing company and say, and admit, admit, and you can go and you can read what the NLRB says, admit that they've done nothing wrong. Admit that Boeing has done nothing wrong in any of its statements, but still taking the position that they have the basis for bringing a lawsuit against this company in order to do nothing else but to shake it down. We saw the shoe, but my, my colleague, uh, Mr. Speaker, mentioned the other shoe to drop when the NLRB came forward through its spokesman and said, listen, you know, this whole thing could just go away if Boeing would agree to build three more airplanes every single month in Washington State. That's what this is about. That's what this is about. This is about using leverage. It's about using muscle. It's about pushing around a private business simply because you can. And it's absolutely and positively wrong for our government to be doing this to its own citizens. That's exactly what's happening. They're walking into Boeing and saying, boy, it would be a real shame if we shut you down in South Carolina, wouldn't it? You can make that not happen. You have it in your ability to make sure this terrible thing does not happen to you. All you have to do is agree to produce an additional three planes in Washington State. What a travesty. What a complete insult to what this nation stands for. And it brings me, Mr. Speaker, to the second point, which is why should ordinary people care about this? Is this just an issue that the state of South Carolina cares about? Is it just an issue that the Boeing Corporation should care about? Is it just an issue that business should care about? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. This is an issue that every single working person in this country should be scared to death of. Because the day that, biz that government can tell business where it can operate, which is what the NLRB is trying to do in this lawsuit, the day the government can tell business where it can operate is the day before it can tell you where you can go to work. And if Boeing is not free to, mo to leave Seattle, Washington and move to North Charleston in South Carolina, then the next day you might not be free to do the same thing. It violates everything we stand for. It violates everything that makes this country exceptional. It brings up frightening thoughts of what's happened in other countries in the past. It is wrong, Mr. Speaker. It must stop now. We will do everything that we can in this delegation to prevent it from happening. And more importantly, we will be ever diligent to make sure that after this one is put to bed, and after this NLRB lawsuit is exposed for the fraud that it is, we will be ever diligent to make sure that it never happens again in this country. And I yield back the balance of my time. Mr. Mulvaney, uh, while you were uh, talking so eloquently in defense of freedom, not, not in defense of South Carolina, but in defense of freedom, and the freedom uh, to pursue the free market, something as fundamental as that, we've been joined by our colleague from South Carolina, uh, Congressman Jeff Duncan, and I would yield him such time as he may consume on this issue or any other issue on his heart. Well, first off, let me thank uh, my colleagues for taking this time to talk about an issue that, you know, I cannot believe we're even having this discussion. You know, we've seen a lot since we've been here in Washington since January the 5th, but I never thought I'd see the day that the NLRB and our government would sue a company over creating jobs in South Carolina. You know, I may have experienced that in another country, say the uh, Soviet Union back in the 80s, but to think that we've got a government here in, in America that is suing a company for making a business decision, a decision that would affect their bottom line, to go where their labor costs are cheaper, to come to a great state like South Carolina and locate in a wonderful city like North Charleston, where they were already operating a, uh, an operation that made the fuselages. This was a decision not to locate a whole other operation, but to, to bring the rest of the components to South Carolina, to assemble the complete aircraft there. And, you know, since they made that decision to come to South Carolina, They've added an additional 2,000 jobs in the state of Washington. And so for the NLRB to say that Boeing made a decision to punish a union in Washington is ludicrous. It's ludicrous. 
You know, Virginia Attorney General Ken Cusinelli said that NLRB's action against Boeing are a threat to every right to work state. And I agree with him. Because if this suit is successful against Boeing, we're not going to have the conversation in this country about whether a business is going to locate in a right to work state or a union state. The conversation is going to turn, Mr. Gowdy, to a conversation about whether to locate in America or to locate that operation overseas. That ought to scare every one of us, not just those in the right to work state, but every America that understands capitalism and understands that government doesn't create jobs, businesses do. You know, looking at the NLRB's decision and examining recent electoral map, it's difficult to see, uh, it's not difficult to see, rather, a policy that clearly rewards blue states while severely punishing red ones. South Carolina's a red state, and we're proud of that fact. We shouldn't be punished for Boeing locating in South Carolina. And this is the second attempt at NLRB to punish South Carolina. You know, right before this, they decided to sue South Carolina, South Dakota, Arizona, and Utah over the right to a secret ballot. Back in November, Mr. Speaker, 80% of South Carolinians voted in a referendum that we like the right to a secret ballot when it comes to union elections, that we don't want card check uh, a method where union bosses can come to employees and say, you know, we really want to unionize here and we'd love to have your name and, and through fear and intimidation get them to agree to go along and unionize after a majority of those people in that business have said under intimidation usually that they would go along with the union. We like the right to a secret ballot that free Americans can go into the voting booth, whether it's at a union or anywhere else, and cast a ballot in secret without fear of intimidation and go in there and cast a vote how they feel on whether they want to collectively bargain, whether they want to unionize, or whether they like the right to come to work and negotiate with their employer for their best interest and for the best interest of the company. For the best interest of the company. And so NLRB said, nope, South Carolina, Utah, South Dakota, Arizona, we determine how you're going to unionize. We determine what method you're going to use. And if we say that you have to use card check as a method of, an, of unionization, that's what you have to use. And just because you in South Carolina, 80% of your voters like the right to a secret ballot, that doesn't matter. That's off the table. Because NLRB is saying they have the last word. They are the only voice. And you know what? That's wrong. Because it comes into a state's rights issue. The Constitution I carry says that Congress... I'm going to get a little passionate on this issue because I, I feel NLRB has overstepped the bounds on this. It says that no power, not specifically outlined in that document as belonging to the federal government, nor prohibited by that document to the states and is reserved for the states or the people. It doesn't say the NLRB has got the right to determine how we can unionize in South Carolina or any other right to work state. I think states do have rights. And I think we've got to stand up, and I applaud my colleagues tonight for standing on this floor and championing states' rights, championing the Constitution of the United States, championing the Tenth Amendment, pointing out the rightful place of the states in this country that freely join the Republic. So after the NLRB decided to sue these four states, they came in and decided to sue a private business to sue a business that made a business decision to affect the bottom line, shareholder value, looking after profit, which others want to demonize in this country, but which made this country great. Capitalists going out, investing their hard-earned dollars, convincing others to invest their money in their stock, to grow a business, create a product that folks around the world will want to buy, and folks like buying Boeing products. I applaud Boeing for wanting to come to South Carolina to investing their billions of dollars in our state, their idea of staying there for 100 years, their love for South Carolina workers, for the climate, the pro-business climate we have in our state, the pro-business climate they have in North Charleston, the effort that South Carolina had to step up to the plate to help Boeing in the, in the deal to come to South Carolina. And I look forward to flying on a Boeing aircraft manufactured the Dreamliner, 
What a great name. We're talking about a shattering of American dreams by the NLRB suing Boeing, who is chasing the American dream, but yet they're chasing it to form an airplane called the Dreamliner. Is that not irony? I can't believe we're having this discussion, but I tell you what, we're doing the right thing. And this Congress needs to get behind defunding the NLRB's ability to sue South Carolina, to sue Boeing. We need to get behind that. Mr. Gowdy, thank you for uh, having this, and I'll yield back. Well, my, my colleague from South Carolina raises the, the, the second issue, doesn't he? It, it wasn't just the complaint against Boeing. It was also the threatened litigation over South Carolina having the unmitigated temerity to want to memorialize the right to a secret ballot in the Constitution of our state. Our voters voted to do that, to memorialize the right, something as sacred in this country is the right to secret ballot. And the reward for memorializing that in our Constitution was threatened litigation by the NLRB. And when our Attorney General, Alan Wilson, fought back, the response was, well, let's see if we can settle it. And I think that's instructive because no sooner had the threatened lawsuit, the threatened litigation against Boeing been, been announced that there's another effort to want to settle it, as if these are two private companies who are negotiating over an easement. Will the gentleman yield? Yes, gladly. You know, they said we'll talk with uh, Attorney General Wilson and the other Attorney Generals, but they said we're going to do it in secret. We're going to do it in secret. They demanded secret meetings, made threats, and they attacked the right to secret ballot. That doesn't uh, exactly look like a good track record. Had you heard about that? Uh, not only, Congressman, had I heard about that, I read a quote attributed to the NLRB just this week where they're advising Boeing and its counsel not to litigate this in the media. Imagine, imagine the arrogance of telling a company not to litigate something in the media. These are not two private parties. This is a government agency taking legal action against a private company, and then they advise, don't discuss this in the media. And the second thing, and I'd love to ask Congressman Mulvaney his thoughts on this, there was a quote attributed to a senator advising the NLRB, do not share your legal strategy publicly. Do not tell the other side what your legal strategy is. This is not a criminal case. This is not a civil case between two private companies. This is a government agency that is seeking to influence the business decisions of a private company. And they're telling, they're getting legal advice from a senator not to share their strategy with the other side. And with that, I would recognize the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Mulvaney. And my question to you, Mr. Gowdy, and to Mr. Speaker would be this is, why would there even be a strategy? What is this talk of strategy? That NLRB is charged with enforcing the law. There should be no strategy involved with that. Either it violates the law or it does not. The NLRB itself has already said on more than one occasion that the statements that Boeing made do not rise to the level um, that's required for, for this litigation to proceed. They've already admitted that this is an expansion of a, of a, of a new business. This is a new business line. It is not the moving of a business from one place to the other. And it is the NLRB has already admitted that that is protected activity under the National Labor Relations Act. So you have to wonder, what is the strategy? And, and it raises a really good point. Why are we here? Why is the NLRB doing this? What does it say, Mr. Gowdy, and perhaps this is a rhetorical question, what does it say, for example, about the lawsuit um, that, uh, that Mr. Duncan mentioned before regarding the, the right to a secret ballot? What does it say about an administration in this day and age that specifically attacks not only one state but several states for granting additional freedoms to its citizens. Think about that. That's what we've done. That's what Arizona has done. That's what several other states have done. We have simply um, memorialized in our Constitution the right that we have to a secret ballot. This is the granting of a right. Ordinarily this would be cause of great celebration. But for some reason with this administration, it is not cause for celebration. It is cause for the bringing of lawsuits and litigation. And I have, cannot help but wonder what that says about where we stand as a nation. You know, you have to wonder um, why NLRB is doing this. You know, what is their ultimate ga game? 
I think it's to force a private industry to make a decision that government tells. That's like a government takeover, the government telling a private business what to do or not to do. You know, the American people are tired of the spending and the borrowing and the bailouts and the takeovers. We saw it with General Motors. We've seen it with other businesses. We've seen a government takeover of health care. Now we're seeing the government sue a private business for making a business decision to locate in South Carolina. And we know because we come from the great Palmetto State, we know why they wanted to locate in South Carolina. We know about the work ethic. We know about the wonderful business climate. We know about the wonderful climate period. And I know why they chose Charleston. What a great location. It's not just because the air base is there, the, the close to the uh, port is the, probably the, one of the biggest reasons. The wonderful port that we've got in Charleston. The reason South Carolina is great in the port of Charleston. And while I'm on that, let me just applaud my colleagues across the building there for their help in securing the money that was necessary for deepening and widening the port of Charleston. It was the right decision for the Corps of Engineers to make, and it's the right decision for the business climate in South Carolina, it's the right decision for our state. And it's going to be a perfect business example for South Carolina and for the East Coast. With that, I yield back. Well, I would say this, uh, to, echo, to echo what both of my colleagues have already said, not only is there a tremendous natural climate and a business climate in the state of South Carolina, you will not find a group of people more appreciative for the right to work than our fellow citizens in South Carolina who desperately need the work. And thank you to Boeing and every other company who has been willing to take a chance on the people of South Carolina. We are not easily intimidated. And one of my colleagues asked, what's the NLRB doing? Why now? Well, I think we touched on it earlier. Union membership is at a historic low. At the same time, they seek to have a historically high level of influence with this administration. Mr. Mulvaney, there is no legal uh, analysis by which the NLRB can hope to prevail in this case. This is a political calculus. And I would like, in the few minutes we have remaining, to discuss with both my colleagues the remedy that the NLRB seeks. And it's instructive, I think, to set, the, to set the chronology one more time. Boeing has been manufacturing airplanes in Washington State for at least two decades. And during those, since 1989, there have been four work stoppages. And I read a partial quote by a customer of Boeing's saying, if the unions and the employers and management do not get together, and stop the strikes, we are going to look somewhere else for our airplanes. So you're in a leadership position at a company, and you're being advised that the work stoppages, and there have been four of them, are going to impact your ability to get future business. And you negotiate in good faith, and there has been not one scintilla of evidence to suggest that Boeing did not negotiate in good faith in Washington State. And as our colleague Mr. Mulvaney pointed out, there's no allegation of bad faith. There's no allegation that Boeing did anything wrong other than seek to move to a right-to-work state. When they had planted the flag in a union state, they wanted to move a separate, distinct line of work to a right-to-work state in South Carolina. There are 2,000 more jobs in Washington state than there were. And the, and the comments of the spokesperson for the NLRB are so terribly instructive. If you'll just build more planes in Washington State, we'll shut up about what you did in South Carolina. Can you imagine that as a 16-year prosecutor? Can you imagine me saying, well, I'll excuse what you did here if it were wrong, if you'll just do this instead? If what Boeing had done was really wrong, the NLRB would not be seeking to settle this and negotiate out more work for the state of Washington, which is exactly what they're trying to do. You know, the gentleman from Georgia just a few minutes ago in the last hour was over there talking about us not manufacturing anything in this country anymore, talking about bringing manufacturing back. I don't know if you all heard that. And I sat there and listened, and I thought about the, the irony there, that here we are, we have the NLRB that's suing a business who is operating in this country, who has numerous manufacturing facilities, not just in Washington and South Carolina, who's creating a, a wonderful product that's sought 
all around the world. They're manufacturing it here in this country. They're creating jobs in South Carolina. We are manufacturing here. And so that gentleman, uh, Mr. Scott from Georgia, the message is clear. They are. And they'll continue to do so as long as we have a pro-business economy, as long as we have a pro-business climate. And like I said earlier, if the NLRB wins this suit, Mr. Gowdy, we're going to see decisions made about not whether to locate in a right-to-work state like South Carolina or, or Utah or Arizona or South Dakota or even Virginia or many, many others in this country. We're not going to see that argument about whether to locate in a right-to-work state or a union state. We're going to see truly what he was talking about. We're going to see the decision being made about whether to locate in the United States of America and put Americans to work or locate in another country. That's the question that's going to be asked. Mr. Speaker, I think it's important to realize in this discussion that this is not just an attack on one company, uh, nor is it an attack, just an attack more broadly at some of the principles that we hold to be so dear. This is a specific attack on the people of South Carolina. It is. It's a specific attack on the people that we represent. We live in a state that has chosen to be a right-to-work state. By the way, it's important to know that doesn't mean that unions are against the law in South Carolina. It doesn't mean that they are banned. It doesn't mean it's any more difficult to form. It simply means you don't have to work in a union in order to work in South Carolina. We have chosen to do that. We have come together as a state and said this is the kind of state that we want to be. We want to be a state that balances the needs of business and the needs of workers. We want to be fair to both sides. We don't want to make you do something that you don't want to do just to get a job. That's what we stand for. And this administration in this lawsuit is attacking that. We also chose as a state to give Boeing incentives to come to South Carolina. It was a difficult decision for us to make. I was in the state legislature when we did that. But we said to ourselves as a state, this is such an opportunity. It is one of those true rare times where it's an investment. This was such a rare opportunity for us as a state, not only for this generation, but for several generations. The Boeing Company's been making airplanes since they've been airplanes. And they're going to be making them for another hundred years after this. And we wanted them in our state. So we gave them the incentives. This administration is attacking that. Nowhere does the NLRB say what might happen if they were to succeed to the money that the state of South Carolina has given to Boeing. It's a slap in the face to the people of South Carolina. Finally, and I, you know, you can't, you can't have a discussion up here, or you shouldn't have a discussion up here uh, without talking about jobs. Our people want to work. Our people need to work. It's one of the most hardworking, well-educated, honest, and ethical group of working people that you're going to find in this country. The Boeing Corporation was going to give them the chance to do that in areas that provide tremendous opportunities for us to grow as a state, to grow our wage base, to grow our, our, our skill base. Think about what this meant to the technical college system in our state. Think about what this means to the other opportunities in the aerospace industry alone, never mind the other industries that feed it. We want to work. And this administration is going out of its way to prevent that from happening. Unforgivable. Unforgivable. Unemployment in my district is over 15 percent. And I have to fight with my own administration as to whether or not these people can go to work? This is absolutely wrong. It is unforgivable that this is what it's come to in this nation. Mr. Mr. Speaker, I appreciate the opportunity. I commend the rest of my delegation. Um, I tell you, it's a true honor to be amongst these gentlemen uh, tonight as we sit here and, and try and come to our state's defense against what is clearly an unjustified attack. And I yield back the balance of my time. Well, we saw firsthand when the automotive manufacturing company BMW decided to come to the upstate of South Carolina. Congressman Duncan, Congressman Mulvaney, it transformed the upstate of South Carolina. Every now and again, you have an opportunity to have a company like a BMW or a Boeing or a Michelin or a Millican or a GE that can not just transform a community, but even more importantly, transform individual family lives by giving them the greatest of all family values, a job. And Mr. Mulvaney is exactly right. We come from a state that has a rich 
in some instances, provocative history. But one thing that we all agree on, and it is every member of this delegation, we represent people who want to work. And when you consider the consequences of this complaint, what are the remedies? Are they really going to ask Boeing to dismantle the plant that is under construction in North Charleston? Are they really going to tell Boeing you cannot manufacture this line in this state? Or are they going to do what we really suspect that this is all about, which is negotiating strength so they can force Boeing to do more work in Washington State? We'll let you slide in South Carolina, but you've got to make it up to us in Washington State. That is not the business of this administration. And I applaud my colleagues, those that are here and th those that were not able to join us tonight, because we are in one accord when it comes to standing up for the people and the workers and the state of South Carolina. I would yield to my colleague, Mr. Duncan. You know, Mr. Speaker, I, I just have to ask myself, listening to my colleagues here, thinking about this issue, since when did America stop becoming uh, and being the land of the free? The land of the free that we sing about all the time. Do we just want to say that we're a free nation? Or do we want to be a free nation? Our freedom's under attack, guys. Our freedom is under attack across this nation through suits like the NLRB suing the states, NLRB suing a, a private business for making a business decision. But in America... In America? I can't believe we're witnessing this. And it's not just NLRB, Mr. Gowdy, it's, it's EPA. When they deny an air quality permit for a drilling platform in the Alaskan Sea, where the closest impacted towns over 70 miles away, with only 250 indigenous people there, and I've been out to a deep water drilling platform. I've been to a production platform. And the only air impact that I've seen was the flare gas, where they flare off and, and burn off the, the gas that comes through the natural drilling activities. Usually it's natural gas, and some proponents of, of that side of the debate think that natural gas is, and, and say, I believe that too, is probably cleaner burning. But we've got the EPA denying a drilling, uh, a air quality permit, not a drilling permit this time, so we're not able to meet America's energy needs by domestic production. So we've got NLRB suing the state of South Carolina, the state of Utah, the state of Arizona, and the state of South Dakota. Then we've got them suing a, a fine American company named Boeing. We've got the EPA going after uh, drilling, denying the issue air quality permits. We've got them changing the air quality standards that will affect economic development in my district and around the state of South Carolina. This is a power grab, Mr. Gowdy. This is a power grab by this administration to keep us from being free people, to keep us from being able to make business decisions and creating jobs putting America back to work, America needs to wake up that your freedoms are being eroded day by day. It's hard to believe that January 5th we were elected into Congress and had high optimism for changing the way Washington does business. And then we see this continuation of these policies, which I labeled on the campaign poor policies. I spelled that P-O-R for the stenographers, just one O, P-O-R. I called it Pelosi, Obama, and Reid policies that were bankrupt in this country, and they're continuing today. They're continuing today because they're affecting private businesses that are out creating jobs in states like South Carolina. So I applaud my colleagues, and like you said, those that aren't here, those that may be taking the floor on the other side of the chamber in the United States Senate, those that 
had obligations other places tonight that feel the way we do. That South Carolina is a great state to do business. Boeing made the decision to come there. They made the decision about their bottom line, about profitability, shareholder value, about creating something great, creating the American jobs, manufacturing this country that the gentleman from Georgia talked about. Well, they're doing it. And they're going to do it in South Carolina because I believe they're going to win this lawsuit. I believe they're going to win because it's the right thing. It's the American way. It's unconstitutional, un-American for the NLRB to be suing Boeing. And I believe with my heart they're going to win. They're going to put those thousands of workers to work in South Carolina. They're going to invest their money, and they're going to be there 100 years from now. I yield back. Mr. Speaker, would yield about the balance of our time. The gentleman yields back. For what purpose does the gentleman from South Carolina seek re recognition? I, Mr. Speaker, I move now that the House adjourn. The question is on the motion to adjourn. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes have it. The motion is adopted. Accordingly, the House stands adjourned until 10 a.m. tomorrow. Today in the House, members worked on bills dealing with veterans programs. Tomorrow, the House and Senate